This Brigham Young University devotional by Elder L. Tom Perry was given March 25th, 1990. This is a unique opportunity, and I want you to know that I've given this assignment considerable thought. I started thinking that I should offer an eloquent, respectful introduction of my father, perhaps modeling what I do after the way President Hafen introduces President Lee. But that didn't feel exactly right to me. You see, I firmly believe that I was placed on this earth so every once in a while, my father would know what it feels like to be Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> it would be a mistake to let my father know how I really feel about him. You can interpret that however you like. Uh, <laughs> then I realized that this was a golden opportunity to embarrass my father. After all, he's embarrassed me a few times at General Conference. It's probably time to pay him back. I could do something like, L. Tom Perry, this is your life, or even better, a version of life's most embarrassing moments. <laughs> there was also the possibility of an Elder Perry roast. Then I remembered something. Then I remembered something. My father is speaking after, not before me. He would have the last word, and he can be every bit as mischievous as I am. <laughs> Concluding that sometimes discretion is the better part of valor, I decided that the best thing to do was tell a simple story, a story about an experience my father and I shared that will tell you something about the kind of man he is. My father and I were out in my garden plot a few springs ago preparing a patch of ground for planting. Our soil is of the typical Orem variety, mostly rock. Now, my backyard, which is where the garden is, is encircled by a fence and borders on a cherry orchard. Because my father and I were digging up so many rocks, we found it handy simply to toss them over the fence. Now, I was assuming we would just leave them there. After all, what harm would a few rocks do to our neighbor's orchard? And as it turned out, that's what we did. I did not look over the fence before we went in for the evening, but I think you can assume that we left quite a few rocks on the other side. A few days later, I went out to the backyard to feed our dog after work. I did not see them at first, but there they were, right in the middle of our freshly hoed garden, most of the large rocks my father and I had thrown over the fence. I assumed that it was the man who farmed the orchard behind us who had returned our rocks to us. I had heard that he was something of a cantankerous old fellow. Word around the neighborhood was he didn't even smile at his grandchildren. In fact, the only time I had ever seen him smile was when he was spraying insecticide at us over our backyard fence. <laughs> I, of course, respected his right to have our rocks on his property, but I wasn't very pleased about the way he asserted his right. I called my father to tell him about our reappearing rocks, and his reaction surprised me. I assumed he would be angry that all the work we had done had been destroyed. Instead, he couldn't have been more embarrassed. You see, my father had other plans for those rocks. He's always having plans he doesn't tell me about, by the way. He was going to use them as a border along the back of our fence to prevent wild animals from digging under it. He had never intended to leave the pile of rocks out in our neighbor's orchard at least not for very long. He had simply run out of time. As soon as my father heard about the incident, he made a special trip down from Salt Lake to talk to our neighbor. I tagged along and watched my father approach a man who was so angry he couldn't even look up at us. My father bent over backwards, apologizing, and still it was five minutes before our neighbor even spoke to him. Well, somehow after another 15 minutes, my father finally won the man over with his sincerity. Then what my father did, did was even more remarkable. He got down on his knees with me and we worked side by side well past dark until every rock within 15 feet of the back of our fence was stacked up against it. My father didn't seem to care whether we were moving our rocks or our neighbor's rocks. He wanted them all out of the way. I think he knew that it was ridiculous to have an orchard that clear of rocks, but of course he wasn't just moving rocks. Moreover, I'm certain that even if our neighbor had not thrown the rocks back over the fence, that my father would have still been out there. Perhaps it would have been a few days later. On his hands and knees, 
clearing a 15-foot swath of orchard of rocks. That's because my father has always viewed a fence as something to be climbed over to do good on the other side. Well, Elder Perry is an apostle of the Lord and a special witness of Christ. He is also my father. And more than the inspirational lessons I have heard him preach over the pulpit, I appreciate the simple lessons he has taught me about life by example. He is a great man, and I want to assure you that he does more than give wise counsel. He also lives the counsel he gives. I present to you Elder L. Tom Perry of the Council of the Twelve Apostles. Thank you, Lee. That's one of the better ones. <laughs> We've enjoyed our life together. I think the relationship of father and son is special on this earth. And I'll always cherish those moments we have together. I just wish I could train him to be a gardener. <laughs> I've never been able to encourage him in that great art of growing a garden. Carolyn's pretty good, but uh, Lee still has a couple of problems with gardening. A few years ago, I was assigned to make a visit to Tonga. While there, I was requested to speak to the student body of the Leahona School. As we gathered on the stand, I gazed over 900 beautiful students seated before me in the school's cultural hall. After the opening exercises, a nice special musical number, the entire student body entered into a, a scripture chase. The scriptural questions were introduced, and all the students who could find them, the right answer would stand up. After each question, a number were eliminated. Finally, only six remained. They were invited to come forward, and to make everything even, they were invited to place the scriptures on their head. The situation was presented. They were to take the scripture off their head, find it, and then report. It was amazing there what happened with a young lady. I was absolutely astounded. She would pick up her scripture, put it on her head, just bob her head, and it would fall open to the right answer, and she'd read it. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So I insisted that she take my scriptures. I thought she had some sort of a trick that she was playing on us. And then I read a question challenging the six participants, and clearly she was the winner again. A most remarkable young lady. I was profoundly impressed with the scripture chase. So tonight, because this is a fireside, I've decided to have a scripture chase. Now, I've invited six of the students of the stakes, that, uh, four of the students that are participating here this evening, to come forward. If you please come forward and join me up here. Now, Mike Hickson, mm -hmm. please come. You're the first. Oh, good. Mike, which school are you in? Business. Business. Mm -hmm. Well, that stands you in good stead. <laughs> I like that. I do, too. <laughs> Where's your home? Simi Valley, California. Oh, great. And what year are you? Junior. Junior, excellent. Well, I have for you a scripture here that was printed in 1842. Probably one very similar to what the prophet Joseph Smith was using at the time he was studying. If you please take that one. Next, Rose Howell. Rose? Now, tell me where you're from. St. Louis. St. Louis. And what year are you? Sophomore. Sophomore? Uh -huh. And what's your field? Sociology. Excellent. Very good. I couldn't find my missionary scriptures. I don't know what I've done with those, Linda, Gay. They must be up in your attic someplace. <laughs> but I have one that was printed at the same vintage of scriptures here, just like I carried on my mission back in the 1942. 
Well, you take that one. Now, Kathy Howe, are you related? Uh-huh. Please come up here. You're from St. Louis also? Yeah. And what's your field? Open, G. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, you're my model tonight. That's just exactly the subject I'm talking about. How did you ever guess? Spirit. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm glad you have the spirit. <laughs> and what year are you? Freshman. You're the younger sister? Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, very good. I have the latest edition here that was printed in 1979, the one we're using today. Now, if you look in the old scripture, we have a concordance, the one you have, a ready reference, and this one, a topical guide. Now, Corey Steele? Where are you from? I'm from Simi Valley, California. Also. Oh, another close neighbor here, huh? Right. And what's your field? Accounting. Accounting. Good, we've got two accountants. Now, just for you, I've brought a computer. <laughs> and we have LDS View on this computer. So now, if you'll open up the computer, I'm going to have you find, each of you find for me, <laughs> Someone turn the computer on. Oh, yes, you better throw the switch. Where's the switch, Lee? Oh, it turned off. Uh-oh. Boy, how did it turn off? Sorry. There we are. Go ahead and talk. Well, uh... You think you can handle this all right, Lee? Now, what we're going to do is in the 1842 edition, we're going to use the concordance. My mission field edition, 1942, the ready reference, 1979, the topical guide, and the computer program, we're going to use, what's the name of it now? You said it's different in LDS view. It's Folio's. Uh, Folio's, uh-huh. All right, are you ready to go? <laughs> All right, my message tonight is this scripture. I want each of you to find it to see which one can move the most rapidly. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Please tell me where that's found. <laughs> Proverbs, <laughs> Proverbs 29, 18. My goodness, where were the rest of you while I was going on? <laughs> I assure you it's in there. Couldn't you find it? Come on, people. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. If this hadn't worked, my whole talk would have been ruined. <laughs> let's take, let's see. Let me just, uh, mind if I get out of this? Now, of course, it was obvious that the computer would be much more rapid than the scriptures that we have before. Scholarship and technology have opened new visions for us, new opportunities to grow, to understand that we've never experienced before in the history of mankind. The demonstration also begs the question, where do we stand as individuals in using these wonderful, beautiful, techniques the world is supplying for us today. Are we still scriptorians in the 1842 vintage, the 1940s, the 1979s? Are we so excited about what the world has to offer for us in this age that we're eager to take advantage of every opportunity that's presented to us? Now, of course, the key word in this scripture that I want to use as my text tonight is vision. The dictionary has four specific definitions for vision. The first, something seen in a dream, a trance, or ecstasy, a supernatural appearance that conveys a revelation. Another one, an act or power of seeing, sight. Another, something seen, a lively or charming sight. 
But the one I want to use tonight is an act or power of imagination, mode of seeing or conceiving, unusual discernment or foresight. That's the one we want to use tonight. We live in a mo most remarkable period of change. Just look what's happened in the last few months. Bold headlines in the Time magazine not so long ago, ago declared, freedom, the wall crumbles overnight. Berliners embrace an unbelievable joy and a stunned world ponders the consequences. The article goes on to say, for 28 years, it has stood as a symbol, a division between Europe and the world, the Berlin Wall, that hideous 28-mile scar throughout the heart of a once proud European capital, not to mention the souls of people. And then, poof, it was gone. Not physically, at least yet, but gone as an effective barrier between East and West open in one unmistakable, stunning stroke to the people who had been kept apart for generations. It was one of those rare times when history shifts beneath men's feet, and nothing after is quite the same. Once there was a break in the wall, there was no way of containing the spirit of the people and their desire to have freedom. A little more than a month later, after these, this remarkable article, the Romanians were trying to comprehend their newly found freedom. A news correspondent from Associated Press on December 30th wrote this. In a passion that fueled Romanians' revolution, freedom was spoken again and again. But to a people forced to register even their typewriters, the full meaning of the exotic word was difficult to grasp. What is it to live free, to travel free, to speak free, said a young medical student. We have only seen darkness and silence. We cannot realize what freedom is. You grow up in freedom. You do not realize what it means to us. She paused and frowned and apologized for her poor English. I am sorry, she said. I learn English 11 years. This is the first time I'm allowed to speak it. Imagine that, studying 11 years, hoping someday she would have an opportunity to speak in a language that typified freedom. As I've witnessed these exciting events in the last few months, the privilege of living under a system which grants to us the right to live free suddenly has become more meaningful to me. Maybe it is time that we listen to their cries and with a self-determination make every effort to really understand this God-given blessing to us here in mortality. Now other nations are anxious for the light of freedom that we have enjoyed for over 200 years. We should be a beacon to lead them to more fulfilling lives. Never has the opportunity and the challenge been greater to make our system work the way it was intended than it is today. We're assembled here as a body of students seeking a higher education. What talent and innate ability we've brought together tonight under this Marriott Center roof. Let us sit and reason together for a few minutes to see how we can maximize the potential power that is within each one of us for the benefit of our fellow man. The first step would be to take advantage of the educational opportunities and which are available to us in these institutions which we're currently enrolled. There's a New Testament scripture which reads, For which of you intend to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest haply, after he's laid the foundation, he's not able to finish it. And all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man begin to build, 
but was not able to finish. I'm afraid there are many of us here tonight who approach our education without a vision of where, what we want or where we want to go. We have not used the power of our imagination or a mode of seeing or conceiving or any discernment or foresight. How often I meet full-time missionaries in the field just before they're returning home after completing a, a successful mission, and I ask them, what comes next? Some answer, I'm going to return to school. What are your educational objectives? The answer comes back, doctors, lawyers, merchants, engineers, or some other field. Then I meet them some months later when they're enrolled in a university or college. I inquire of how their plans are progressing. Many say, oh, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to be a doctor. I don't like the chemistry requirement. The next question is, what are you pursuing now? The answer is all too often, I'm enrolled in university studies until I can make a de de determination of where I want to go. Now, there's nothing wrong with university studies if it's a well-thought-out objective that will lead to something. If it's just a way of marking time until you've made a determination in your career, the career you want to pursue, then you're wasting precious time and the resources of the universities and the colleges you are attending. There was an article in the newspaper the other night that said most university students are taking six years to complete a four-year course. The main reason for the extended time is the periodic change of majors. For one reason, some of you approach your schooling like going to a grocery store, <laughs> using your hard-earned money to buy four sacks of groceries, paying for all four, then leaving one on the counter and walking out, not taking adv your advantages in a timely fashion of what you're having the privilege here to receive. This creates two problems. First, there's a great personal loss to you in both time and resource. Second, you're creating a burden on the church and on the state who are supplying much of the financial means committed to your education. You occupy a place and using a resource that someone else could use. Who knows the direction they want to go? The enrollments of these schools are filling up very rapidly. In fact, the provost will tell you that we're way over enrollment here. And the executive committee is a little concerned about it, right? <laughs> if you're still searching for a direction you'd like to pursue in your life, maybe you should take a little time away from school to catch the vision of what you really want to do, the course you want to pursue. Ah, now it's not my objective here tonight to discourage you from earnestly seeking after the best education you're capable of obtaining. Without it, you place yourself in a disadvantaged position in an ever-changing world. What I'm trying to say is to pray, to study, to seek, to plan, to test, to discuss, and earnestly strive, not for the easy and comfortable way, but for the soul-satisfying, diligent, energetic course that will lead you to the opportunities you're earnestly seeking. Enrollment in a school of higher learning is not classified under the heading of an entitlement as the result of your birthright. It is a privilege to be associated, to be ap appreciated, and to be taken advantage of to the best of your abilities. I want to leave a couple of concepts with you tonight to remind you of setting goals that bring growth into your life. Thoreau reminded us that men were born to succeed and not to fail. The line between success and failure may be all so fine that we scarcely know when we pass over it. Often we throw up our hands in hard times. When with just a little effort, little extra effort and a little more patience, we would have achieved success. Persistence 
can turn what seems hopeless failure into a joyous success. There's no failure except in no longer trying. Failure is not falling down, but staying down. There is a single factor that makes for successful living. It is the ability to draw dividends from defeat. I want to talk to you about the premise that growth is the only real sign of life. We accept this premise in the plant kingdom. Each spring, we look forward to growth to determine if plants have survived the winter and are indeed alive. I believe it is also true of individuals, for families, for businesses, or for the church. Growth is essential for life and vitality. When we think of growth, most of us just think of adding. Growth really has three dimensions, adding, shedding, and perhaps the most important, leveraging our natural God-given talents and strengths. I believe success in any or all dimensions of life comes primarily from leveraging our strengths and our gifts. I would define leveraging for our purpose tonight as using the power and effectiveness we have within us to organize our strengths to gain greater advantage from them. When I am in need of special motivation to leverage myself to greater accomplishment, I often turn to records in the, in the scriptures that seem to inspire me and seem to never grow old. Could I use one for you as an example tonight? The story of Joseph in Egypt. Imagine you are in Joseph's shoes and find yourself in this situation. We re read the remarkable story about this family that had the large number of boys. One of the sons, Joseph, was loved by his father more than his other brothers. To show his love to his son, he, the father made him a coat of many colors. And the scripture records, and when his brethren saw that his father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Now, Joseph didn't make matters any better. He used to have dreams. Can you imagine coming to the breakfast table and telling your brethren something like this? He said to his brothers, Here I pray you, this dream I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. Can you just imagine what would happen telling your brothers that way? Try that on your sister sometime when you go home. <laughs> His brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet even more because of his dreams and because of his words. Not to complicate the process, the father allowed Joseph to st stay home, sent his brethren out in the field to tend the flocks, and every now and then would say to Joseph, go out and check up on your brothers. One day they saw him coming from afar, and they felt as if they could stand their brother no longer, and they conspired to slay him. They conceived a plan that would kill him, and tell their father that some wild beast had devoured their brother. But one had compassion on their brother, did not want the blood of his brother on his hands. He persuaded his brother to cast him and cast Joseph into a pit. Then they would not be responsible for his death. Then another brother, who was a great merchant, evidently, <laughs> brother, said, What profit is it, is it for us to slay our brother, conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hands be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. So they sold his, their 17-year-old brother to a caravan on their way to Egypt so that he would be sold as a slave in a strange land with a strange tongue that had strange customs. Out of this comfortable home and environment that he'd been associated with, now, that would almost destroy the spirit of any young man. But not Joseph. He seemed to never be discouraged. 
He thought, if I have to be a slave, I'll be the best slave there is. And his countenance radiated a special spirit. When he was offered for sale, he was purchased by the captain of the king's guard. It was only a short time before Joseph had so distinguished himself to the captain of the guard that he made him ruler over his whole house. In authority, he was the first servant, and he was made over, er, overseer all, over all the captain had. And the captain put his complete trust, his property, his income, in the hands of Joseph. Now, Joseph was a goodly person and achieved the position of prominence through the help of the Lord, but his troubles were only beginning. This handsome young man attracted the wife of the captain of the guard. One day when he was working alone in the house, she heard him, came in, put her hand on his garment. Joseph, being a righteous man, knew that this was no place for him, and he loosed himself from his garment and fled, left the wife holding Joseph's garment in her hand. Can you imagine what that would do to a woman? <laughs> and the scriptures record, and he got him out. You see, he fled from temptation. He knew when he was in the wrong place. Now when her husband returned, she told a terrible story about Joseph, and the captain was so angry, he had him cast into prison. Now, not only being separated from your family, being a slave in this strange land, he found himself this time in prison. I can just imagine what the prisons were like in Egypt in that day. They probably were not a very delightful place to spend time. But Joseph, again, not being easily, easily discouraged, he set about to become the best prisoner in all the prison, and soon he gained favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Again, the scriptures record, and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. Now he was the chief prisoner in the prison. <laughs> Never discouraged. You see, Joseph was given the highest position he could possibly obtain. He tried to seize on every opportunity to advance his growth and development. Cast into the prison shortly after Joseph were two of the king's officers, the chief butler and chief baker. Joseph soon became acquainted with them. They both had dreams. Because Joseph was a righteous man, he interpreted their dreams. To one, he said, you will not get out of prison, but lose your life here. To the other, he said, you will soon have the opportunity of returning to your former position of honor with the Pharaoh. Then he said to the one who would be returned to the Pharaoh, to his former position, please remember me to the Pharaoh. I'm tired of this prison life. I want to be released. The chief butler was restored to his position of prominence, forgot all about Joseph for two years. Then one day the king had a dream, which none of the wise men could interpret. Then the chief butler remembered Joseph, and he went to the king and said, there's a man in prison who can interpret your dream. The Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and Joseph, under the inspiration of the Lord, interpreted the king's dream. The king, the Pharaoh, was so impressed with Joseph that he was released from prison and made a servant, serving him. So Joseph again distinguished himself, so much as a servant of the Pharaoh, that he soon became chief among all the servants. In fact, became second in all the land of Egypt, second only to the Pharaoh himself. He turned every situation he encountered in life into an opportunity for growth. Because of jo the service of Joseph rendered, the Pharaoh said unto the other servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And the Pharaoh recognized that Joseph was indeed directed by the Lord when he said unto him, For inasmuch as God hath showed these, thee all this, there is none so discreet 
and wise as thou art. Do you see what happened to Joseph when he was faced with difficult problems? He leveraged every opportunity to take advantage of it, to place him in a position where he could grow, progress, and achieve. To order to in order to maximize our growth, we must identify clearly what are our natural gifts and our talents. We all have them in abundance. We can determine these in a number of ways. We can go and receive a father's blessing, a patriarchal blessing. We can keep track of a record of our accomplishments. We can go through some sp specific testing. Or we can talk to others as they have impressions about what we can do and what are our talents. In our life's planning, if we want to optimize our opportunities for success, we need to align ourselves with our natural strengths and gifts. We need to consistently and carefully select a few items that will add to our growth, including ways we think about our behavior, specific capabilities, our knowledge and skills that we have acquired. In addition to adding, we also need to identify one or two items that seem to get in our way. There are barriers to our growth. And then we need to set on a course of shedding those. These might include ways we think about things, our behavior, our habits, our lack of decision making, or whatever they may be. This approach to our growth recognizes individual uniqueness and distinct distinctiveness that God has given to each one of us, and then positions us to leverage our uniqueness and distinctiveness for our own individual successes. This does not assume a path of least resistance. It does not assume any particular measure of success. It does not assume an economic measure, but rather focuses on becoming all that we can become. Let us look for a minute at learning. A.G. Bennett in his book on transformation said this, the ability to learn is so precious a quality that it cannot disappear from a perfect man. To be able to learn is to be young, and whosoever keeps the joy of learning fresh within him remains young forever. The ignorant man is like a prisoner that languishes in a narrow cell, which will later become his grave, because he has not learned that the door is not locked. Everyone can find within himself or herself inward attitudes of mind or outward habits of behavior that are contrary to our own ideals. Struggle within oneself can also be called self-discipline. Through struggle we become stronger. By ceasing to struggle, we only grow weaker. So long as we are dissatisfied and do not know what we, what we really want, we shall probably do plenty of foolish things. Self-knowledge and struggle within oneself go hand in hand. Organize your struggles. Choose with what you will struggle. Persistence will do what cannot be achieved by force. Persistence is a twin sister of excellence. Remember that what is a present struggle is the key to future happiness. Never stop to regret failure or to excuse them. Paul encouraged us to forget our failures and move on when he told the Philippians, this is one thing I do. Forget those things which are behind and reach forth unto those things which are before. Great lesson from Paul. President Kimball has said, life gives to all choices. You can be satisfied with yourself with mediocrity if you wish. You can be common, ordinary, dull, colorless, or you can channel your life so that you'll be clean, vibrant, progressive, useful, colorful, and rich. Certainly any of us who followed the counsel of President Kimball knew how he had to overcome time and time again to be certain that he was accomplishing and growing. 
I continually marveled at that man from the time I had the opportunity to first meet him, how he was always striving, never satisfied with his own performance, always seeking to improve and to grow. Now my prayer for all of us here tonight is that with this life of choices, we may realize who we are and what great potential we have. We may start today to discipline ourselves, to reach for higher goals, to study, to learn, to grow, to determine a course we want to follow as we go through the opportunities of this great mortal experience. We must catch the vision of who we really are and what we can become. For where there is no vision, the people perish. The Lord has truly blessed us. If we will only do our part and utilize our talents and our opportunities that He has given us to set our direction on a course that will lead us back to His presence, he will bless us mightily with His Spirit. Now, it's always a joy to come to this great place, be with you vibrant, alive students who have so much to offer the world. What a privilege we're having. What an opportunity. What a contribution we can make to the world in which we live if we'll only follow the counsel and study and listen and grow and realize our potential here. Never be satisfied with where you are. Always be reaching out to make the world a better place, to make your sacrifice for the benefit of your fellow men. Start tomorrow morning with your roommate. Get up and do something nice for her or him. Might be quite a shock to them the first time you try it. We don't want to have any heart attacks in the morning. Start with something slow and easy. <laughs> but see what delight that brings into your life as you have opportunity to make that kind of a contribution. We leave our blessing on each one of you that you may realize your great potential and opportunity, that you may seize upon it and use this opportunity to do the best you can to bring joy and happiness into a great and troubled world. The Lord lives. Jesus is the Christ, the Savior of the world. He has led the way, not through an easy life, but through one most difficult, to give to us the greatest of all blessings possible to obtain. May we follow and be His disciples as we progress through life is my prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. For more information on this program, please visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. This Brigham Young University devotional by Elder L. Tom Perry was given March 25, 1990.